Last week, we took a look at the first device to reproduce sound, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Being able to hear another person's voice over a wire was no doubt a revolutionary concept, but until the following year, 1877, no one had yet to hear their own voice. That's because the telephone only moved sound from one place to another. No one yet knew how to record sound to be played back later, but Thomas Edison figured it out, and he did it using an unlikely household product, tinfoil. This week, we'll be exploring how Edison used the ideas in the telephone to make sound echo all around the world. I'm Alec, and this is Technology Connections. Quick recap for those that are just jumping in now. Sound waves come from the rapid fluctuations in air pressure caused by vibrating objects. Martin Beale's phonograph successfully captured these sound waves using a vibrating diaphragm that vibrated due to ambient sound. Alexander Graham Bell used a similar diaphragm attached to a variable resistor to modulate an electrical signal based on its movement. That electrical signal could duplicate the movement in a second diaphragm using an electromagnet, allowing for the electrical transmission of sound waves. Now here's where Edison steps in to make a record of all this. Sound was no foreign concept to Edison. Just like his colleagues, he understood that sound was just a physical phenomenon caused by the vibration of objects being sent through a medium, generally the air. Indeed, he was studying the telephone and he knew exactly how it worked. But his quest wasn't one of transmission, it was one of recording. How could you record these sound waves to be played back at a later time? The idea of recording information didn't come about after seeing the telephone, though. No, Edison already had an idea for recording telegraph messages. Sort of like a primitive answering machine, his idea was to make something that could record the sequence of dashes and dots being sent over a telegraph wire. That way, telegraph messages could be received even if the telegraph was unattended. In his own words, I was experimenting on an automatic method of recording telegraph messages on a disk of paper laid on a revolving platen. The platen had a spiral groove on its surface. Over this was placed a circular disk of paper. An electromagnet with the embossing point connected to an arm traveled over the disk, and any signals given through the magnets were embossed on the disk of paper. If this disk was removed from the machine and put on a similar machine provided with a contact point, the embossed record would cause the signals to be repeated into another wire. The ordinary speed of telegraphic signals is 35 to 40 words a minute, but with this machine, several hundred words were possible. To clarify a few things, embossing means to raise the surface of paper. Edison's idea was to trace a spiral on a disk of paper, and if the telegraph was sending a signal, an electromagnet would press into the paper and raise its surface. You'd therefore end up with a spiral covered in dashes and dots, almost like braille. You could run this disk through a similar machine designed to detect the bumps, and now you could replay the message as the machine detected them. A side effect, as Edison pointed out, was that it could also be done much faster than the message was sent. You might notice a creepy similarity between this and another sound recording technology that won't be invented for over a century. We'll talk about that when we get there, but I'll just say that this isn't the last time we'll see data represented as bumps on the surface of a disk. So then, how did this help Edison figure out how to record sound? Well, remember, he'd seen the telephone. He knew how you could make a diaphragm vibrate because of ambient sound. The real question was to figure out how to take a vibrating diaphragm and make a recording. Martin Veal sort of already figured this out with the phonograph, but recall that his recordings were only visual. There was no way to play them back, at least yet. Edison's invention was the result of a combination between his own telegraph recording idea and Bell's telephone. Like the telephone, he used a vibrating diaphragm to capture sound, but instead of attaching it to a variable resistor, he attached it to a sharp stylus. Then he modified his telegraph recording concept. He changed the disc into a cylinder, which was a dooming mistake that we'll explore later. But most importantly, he changed the paper into tinfoil. Tinfoil is malleable and can be embossed with little effort, which is an important requirement for recording sound. In his new invention, the stylus would rest on the surface of the cylinder, and as it rotated, a mechanism dragged the stylus sideways so that it drew a spiral on the cylinder's surface. Because tinfoil is so malleable, the stylus would press into the cylinder and make a fairly deep groove. Now here's why tinfoil is key. Because of its malleability, the depth of the groove is dependent on the force with which the stylus is pressing into the cylinder. Edison attached this stylus to a sound-absorbing diaphragm, just like the ones we've seen in the telephone and phonograph. It was arranged such that the vibrations picked up by the diaphragm were translated into an up-and-down motion in the stylus. So recall that the depth of the groove the stylus created in the tinfoil was dependent on the force applied to the stylus. 
If the stylus is moving up and down as it creates the groove, then the height of the groove will similarly rise and fall. What this means is that any sound vibrations that are picked up by the diaphragm will be pressed into the surface of the cylinder by the vibrating stylus. So now, instead of having a simple spiral groove, we have a groove that's surface is augmented by a series of bumps, each bump caused by the vibrations in the stylus. So now we, in theory, have the sound stored on the surface of the cylinder. The sound waves have been transformed into a physical impression on the cylinder surface. Edison didn't really know if this would work. He basically just tweaked his telegraph recording idea a little bit and pretty much didn't expect results. He ran his machine while shouting, Mary had a little lamb into the diaphragm. He ran it again, this time without speaking, and much to his surprise, the machine spoke. Thomas Edison became the first person to hear his own voice and subsequently the first person to question whether or not his voice was really that funny. The machine worked as Edison thought it might. The tinfoil had the unique combination of being malleable enough to have sound waves imprinted in it, but strong enough to withstand being run over again by the stylus. So during recording, the vibrations being picked up by the diaphragm would be pressed into the surface of the cylinder by the vibrating stylus. If you ran the machine again, now the bumps in the cylinder will move the stylus and thus the diaphragm, making the diaphragm move in the exact same pattern it did when recording. This was the exact same concept as the telephone. Duplicate the action of a vibrating diaphragm and you can duplicate a sound. But instead of changing sound into an electrical signal to be transmitted, Edison changed sound into a physical object, a groove. When the stylus vibrates because of the groove itself, now the same sound can be heard again. To help explain the concept, let's take a look at what an actual sound wave looks like. Now remember, the shape of a sound wave impacts its sound. That's what the phonograph was designed to study. But we'll start out with a simple one. This is what's called a sine wave, and it sounds like this. Obviously, we can't see sound, but this shape helps us visualize sound's energy. Remember, sound comes from objects pushing air back and forth. So what this wave shows is the sound's energy over time. The midpoint represents zero energy. Anytime the line is above the midpoint, it means that sound energy is pushing on us. When it's below the midpoint, sound energy is pulling on us. Remember, that's how your ears work. The ear detects when sound is pushing and pulling because the eardrum moves as a result of this energy. So how come we get this shape? Well, imagine I rig up a pen to mark the amount of sound energy currently hitting it. If there's no energy, the pen rests here. If there's a lot of energy, the pen goes up. And if energy is pulling on us, the pen goes down. So if sound is hitting the pen, it will steadily move up and down, or vibrate. But it's just drawing in the same spot. It can only tell us what the sound energy is instantaneously, because even though it's writing, it's always writing in the same place. But if we drag the paper sideways, look at the shape we get. It's that sound wave. By dragging the paper sideways, we've introduced a second measurement, time. Now that we have a sound wave, we can move the sound wave past the pen and retrace its movement. If I follow the line as it moves past, now I'm moving the pen just like it moved because of sound in the first place. Edison's phonograph worked exactly like this. Replace the pen with the stylus and replace the paper with the tinfoil cylinder and you've just invented the phonograph. Sound energy hitting the recording diaphragm made the stylus move up and down just like our pen. As the tinfoil whizzed by, the up and down motion of the stylus caused by sound hitting the diaphragm made the groove's height rise and fall as it created it. Just like our pen drew a wavy line on paper, the stylus pressed a wavy line into the tinfoil. And now we have a way to retrace the movement of the stylus. Just run the machine again, and the height differences now embedded in the groove, the wavy line, will move the stylus up and down. Since the stylus moves the diaphragm, we'll be able to hear the same sound once more. Edison shocked the world with his invention. For the first time, a machine spoke. But it wasn't without its flaws. For one thing, the tinfoil recordings were absurdly fragile. You couldn't get them off the machine without destroying them. And they also wore out quickly. While tinfoil's malleability was essential to prove the concept, it also meant that the recordings would wear out quickly. They couldn't withstand being played back more than a few times before the sound recorded in them was worn away. Someone would have to make improvements, and wouldn't you know it, our old friend Alexander Graham Bell took charge. His team at the Volta Laboratories made many essential improvements, chief among them was changing the recording medium to wax. This solved the durability problems, and it also sounded better. They experimented more and more on the phonograph, perfecting its operation. And then, in 1888, deciding it to be convenient, Thomas Edison returned to the phonograph with most of his work done for him. He started the National Phonograph Company in 1888, which mass-produced machines for home use. Let's take a look at one of these machines and see how it works. 
This Edison standard phonograph is from somewhere around 1906. It's a pretty wonky looking thing, kind of looks like it belongs in the lab of a mad scientist, but it and machines like it were among the very first machines to talk. Not surprisingly, they quickly took on the name talking machines. This one works almost exactly the same as Edison's original phonograph. The records are now removable and made of wax, and there's now a spring-wound mechanism to drive its movement automatically. Other than that, though, it works pretty much the same way. But before we get to the Eureka moment, let's have a look at the mechanism on the inside. Nothing under here is that extraordinary. This barrel has a spring inside that is wound up through this hand crank. The barrel is connected with gears to multiply its speed. The most significant piece down here is the governor. It's called a governor because it holds the highest governmental office in, no, it's called a governor because it regulates or governs the speed at which the mechanism turns. It's actually very simple. These three weights spin around this shaft, and they're attached to the shaft on only one side. As they spin faster, centripetal forces make them move away from the center. Since they're only attached on one side, they start to drag this disc with them as they gain speed. The disc approaches this felt stopper, and once it touches it, the friction created prevents the mechanism from getting any faster. You can adjust the speed of the mechanism by changing where the felt stoppers are in relation to the disc. There's a second felt pad that touches the disc, and it serves as a brake to stop the mechanism. It's attached to a lever up top. Watch what happens when I release it. The weights start to spin, and they begin pulling the disc to the right. Now it's touching the first pad, so friction kicks in and the mechanism stabilizes in speed. Watch one more time. If this governor wasn't here, the spring would unwind faster and faster, and the speed would be uncontrollable. It's really the only important thing down here, though. The mechanism terminates at this pulley. A leather belt is attached to the pulley and transfers the energy up to the top side. Up top is where things start to get interesting. This silver cylinder is called the mandrel. It's tapered, thicker on the left side than the right, so that records can only be put on one way. It spins at 160 revolutions per minute. On the left side are some gears that take some of this motion, slow it down, and drive a worm screw in the back. The worm screw drags the stylus across the cylinder as it plays records. You'll see why this is necessary in a moment. To the right side is a gate used to center the manual when shut, and when open, it lets you slide a record on. These are the actual records. They come in a protective cardboard can lined with felt. They look like this. To put them on the machine, you would open this gate and slide them across the mandrel. You want to be careful here. Remember, these are very, very old. Now you would close the gate which centers the mandrel and it's ready to be played. Now if you look really closely at the surface of the record, you'll see that there are a bunch of lines. This is actually one continuous groove starting at the left and ending on the right. This groove contains sound, literally. It has a physical mark of the sound it recorded. Those vibrations picked up from the diaphragm when recording are right here in this groove. The wobbly lines of the sound wave are translated into physical markings, varying the height of the groove with each vibration. If you look really closely, you can see these marks. Every time the recording diaphragm moved, it changed the height of the groove as it whizzed past. Like in our pen analogy, the stylus vibrated from sound, and the paper it's drawing on was pulled underneath it very fast. You're looking right at that wavy line. The only difference is you're looking from the top. If we could get a good view from the side of the record, you'd be able to see wavy lines just like the one we drew on paper with the pen. Now we can finally talk about the breakthrough device in here. This is called the reproducer. It takes the sound waves embedded in the surface of the record and reproduces them so we can hear them. That's probably why they call it the reproducer. Anyway, I can take it out so we can get a better look. The stylus is on the bottom. It rests in the groove of the cylinder records, and it's hanging from the body on a lever so it puts very little force on the surface of a record. That's why we need the worm screw to drag the reproducer along. The stylus will track the groove, but it's too heavy and there's too much friction for it to move the reproducer sideways on its own. The stylus' up and down motion is transferred via the lever to the inside of the reproducer. And here is, you guessed it, a diaphragm. It's hard to see because of the nipple used to attach the horn, but you can see part of it if you look straight down. The vibrating stylus made this diaphragm vibrate, and as we learned with the telephone, a vibrating diaphragm makes noise. There's very little energy from the tiny motion though, so a sound amplifying horn is attached to make the records easier to hear. So now that we know how it works, well what does it sound like? Well, let's play a record and find out. This one looks interesting, slash is conveniently placed in front of me. So to play the record, we'll first, of course, need to take it out. 
and we'll slide it over the mandrel. Close the gate. I've already wound up the machine, so the last thing we need to do is release this brake to start it spinning. I lied, that's not the very last thing. The horn is actually resting above the record, and it doesn't engage until you pull this stopper out. So all that's left is to pull out the stopper, and now for the first time we'll be able to listen to music at home. Let's see what it sounds like. There we go. Admittedly, this machine sounds pretty bad by today's standards, but it's over a century old and still works. I'm not counting on my iPod to work in 2115. It's interesting how it can play music without any electricity. Except for some luxury machines that had electric motors to run the mandrel, nothing in this machine is electrified. These early machines were all acoustic, meaning that all their sound energy came from the motion of the record and the vibrating stylus. Edison's phonographs were the bee's knees. Everybody just had to have one of these talking machines. But Edison's pride and accuracy doomed his machine to a premature death. And it all had to do with shapes. Thanks for joining me on Technology Connections. Next week, we'll take a look at the simple change that Edison ignored. A change so obvious that we still use it today. The disc.